Hi everyone. I, yeah, I'll be, be brief because um, because of time. Uh, but yeah, we've got um, talks here on uh, drawings, uh, paintings, uh, books, and yeah, the the studios, different kind of aspects, the greenhouse, the summer house, and marble carving areas. So by Stephen Feek, Jenna London, Arrell, Claire Nadal, and Deborah Kane. And so yeah, without further ado, I'll pass you over to Stephen. So this uh, is my current thinking about uh, a series of drawings uh, and paintings um, and how they relate to the bronze sculptures that I'm looking at, uh, having just started my PhD. So in 1956, Hepworth makes the decision to start using metal in her sculpture, first using sheet materials before concentrating on bronze. Uh, the advent of Hepworth's own Bronze Age represented a seismic shift in her practice, and she had to develop new techniques. This transition was not always a, sm a smooth one, and she often found the process frustrating. However, having committed to using metal with considerable success, a year later, everything seems to slow down. Only eight new works emerge in 1957, compared to 23 in 1956. A combination of illness and events in her personal life conspire together, and in her correspondence with Jim Ead in September 1957, she complains that the year had been a strain. Feeling physically and emotionally unable to focus on sculpture, Hepworth instead turned to drawing and painting. I should say, uh, drawing and painting are terms used quite loosely in uh, the few times that Hepworth does talk about uh, that sort of kind of activity. Um, I had largely made the decision that something on paper was a drawing, something on board was a painting, but Jenna has kindly pointed out today that uh, there are drawings on board as well. So it's something I'm getting to grips with as I go along. So uh, spring movement uh, number one is a uh, drawing that I feel particularly fond of. It's the first Hepworth I ever sold when I was working at the New Arts Centre and actually began my thinking about the possibility of doing the PhD that I'm now doing. Uh, it is one of a series of drawings in black ink uh, made in this period, and she made a great number. There are, I've counted, nearly 50. Uh, using ink on paper, applied with a brush or a pen, a hard nibbed reed pen or simple dip pen, and sometimes perhaps even a bamboo cane. These works have a spontaneous looking gestural freedom and often repeat the same motifs, especially the growing plant-like form that we are seeing a lot of now. Uh, and together they can be understood to illustrate her ambitions for an openness of form that would, in theory, only be possible in metal, but not in stone or wood. She also frequently used paint uh, and, and ink applied onto a gesso prepared board, first treated with house paint, uh, and sometimes with a surprising use of vivid color. Not so vivid here. There's one a bit brighter that we'll see a little bit later on. Uh, and occasionally canvas as well. Uh, these works are often linked to Hepworth's interest in Paris Tashism, not least by Hepworth herself. Uh, and because of, the, uh, because of this lyrical expressive use of materials, itself quite a radical departure. Um, they are united by uh, this wonderful sense of physicality. Um, they are referred to in Alan Watts' uh, Way of Zen, which I'm sure we will come to, um, as a kind of dancing on paper. And I think that's a text that uh, was influenced Hepworth a lot. Uh, the other term that's used an awful lot in relation to these is calligraphy, uh, but in a very general westernized version of what calligraphy is or was at that stage. Tashism in Britain developed primarily in opposi opposition to the geometric abstraction of the circle group and unit one and a revulsion against pre-war so-called rational systems of thought. Uh, de Stahl's exhibition in 1952 caused a sensation in London, and his thickly painted canvases appealed to some painters, while the more energetic calligraphic marks of Georges Mathieu appealed to others. Hepworth does something of both. But the importance of the Tash for Hepworth lay not in an aesthetic and ideological sensibility, but the impact it might have for a wider society as well. 
1958, sorry, she wrote to Herbert Reed, Reed Tashism, I have never since 1942 called myself a constructivist, as you know, and therefore I can say that I feel personally that of all the pulses of creation, this has moved me more profoundly than any other. The whole vitality of this stream of painting is incredibly close to research being done by physicists at the moment and by medical research into the source of vitality of healing of wounds, etc. It seems to me very bound up with the aesthetic perceptions of such fundamental rhythms and impulses of growth, growth and form. This is a personal digression, please forgive me, prompted by reading your fine contribution to the Thames and Hudson book. Typically of Hepworth's letters to read, uh, she conflates her interest in art and science and her belief that sculpture especially, though also painting one presumes, could play a fundamental positive role for humankind in general. Although Hepworth expresses her interest in Tashism, she does not, herself call, does not call herself a Tashist. Rather, it offered a different, new, and exciting version of abstraction, one of a growing number of poss possibilities for her and her painter peers, including Alan Davy, William Gere, Patrick Heron, Roger Hilton, Lanyon, Brian Winter, amongst others, all of whom move in and out of the Tashist orbit with varying degrees of conviction. This is what Margaret Garlick has called a, a group of disparate artists united by practice. And as Penelope Curtis has mentioned, for a brief moment in time, contemporary painting had more significance for Hepworth than contemporary sculpture. Jumped ahead slightly. seems to be in the wrong place, sorry. Uh, when Hepworth writes about Tashism, one feels her excitement, and this style of drawing has therefore been described as representing the most en energetic, spontaneous, and joy joyful themes of her drawings and paintings, uh, and they do. However, I have always felt there was a darker sensibility being expressed in these black scribbles and inky daubs. Indeed, the ink was so heavily applied, uh, perhaps angrily applied, it sometimes saturates the paper. This is my own personal digression, but I think they underline the fact that in 1957, uh, it was such an emotionally trying time for her, and the transition from carving to casting was not necessarily straightforward. And since Tashism was all about self-expression and so channeling the subconscious, it seems entirely possible that these drawings emanated from a darker place. That aside, uh, there is a fascinating interplay between Hepworth's work in two and three dimensions at this point. And indeed, there is a distinct visual correspondence between the gestural style of the drawings and certain sculptures, notably Meridian and the smaller scale works which relate to it. The link between Hepworth's drawing and sculpture is complex, however. Uh, as Hepworth claimed that she often came to a sculpture with ideas fully formed and really had the need to make preparatory drawings or advanced sketches unless it was a quick sketch on the back of a fag packet. Cigarette packet, sorry, that was my... Uh, uh. Uh, moreover, uh, her approach is further complicated by the drawings and paintings in which she returns to ideas explored in earlier sculptures, such as Turning Forms uh, drawing here from Kettle's Yard, made four years after the sculpture of the same name. The linearity of Hepworth's drawings and paintings of 57 clearly relates to the profiles of the new sculptures that she had started to make. Though, in fact, uh, she had already begun to explore the possibilities of the expressive line in her sculpture earlier in the 1950s. The synergy between the sculpture and drawings uh, applies as much to works in progress, there's one more there, in that the loopy black lines clearly echo the contours of the sheet metal and wire armatures, armatures that she had started to make in 1956. Uh, as much as they do the finished works made in aluminium, copper, brass, and bronze, made before and after 1957. Together, they suggest that the direct relationship between her drawings and her sculpture uh, is perhaps more overt at this time than at any other. And it is therefore tempting to speculate that some of these drawings were perhaps more preparatory and not just exploratory a sense that is further encouraged by her repeated use of project for sculpture in her titles. 
Despite the geographical remoteness of St. Ives, Hepworth was well aware of new developments and what younger artists were doing. In December 1957, she wrote again to Herbert Reed, Yet in another sense, I belong to the present. Apart from Ben's painting, it is Sam Francis, Soulage, etc., who moved me the most. Both Francis and Soulage were associated with Tashism, even though Francis was American, and both exhibited at Gamblefis. Of the two, Soulage was probably the greater influence. He was partly the reason she enjoyed her time in Paris whilst completing work on Meridian, and she also owned a print by him that's now in the collection here. Unfortunately, records do not confirm yet whether she brought this print from Gampofis or if it was a gift, though the gal gallery feels that it is likely that it did come from them. Tashism was important enough to Hepworth that she travelled to Cambridge with her son Simon to hear Herbert Reed lecture on the subject. In her letter to Reed uh, of December the 15th, 1957, she repeats her interest in attending the lecture and one feels her excitement for the subject. The amazing struggle between science and life in the organic and spiritual sense is reaching tremendously exciting and very, ter very terrifying proportions just now. The Tashists understand the present crucifixion. They heighten the awareness and give one wings to encompass this new life. But if men are to be born and women to sustain a normal pregnancy, the, uni the unique qualities of sculpture with its mysticism and, and magic must find their true forms, lasting forms and still forms. As a result of her enthusiasm, she subsequently invited Reed to give the same lecture at St. Ives for the Penrith Society. There's no text of this lecture that I've been able to find so far, uh, but the lecture was reviewed in the St. Ives Times and Echo, rather usefully, uh, which gives a wonderful account of its scope. The anonymous, I won't read it all out because it's quite long and time is against us, but if anybody's that interested, I can send it to you. Uh, but the anonymous correspondent says, and this dates it somewhat. The lecture was illustrated by lantern slides uh, of paintings by Kandinsky, Jackson Pollock, Mark Toby, Sam Francis, de Buffet, Soulage, Sandra Blow, and others. There was also an interesting picture of infant scribbles showing their surprising purpose and growth and the existence in them of archetypal forms of universal symbols. And he or she, this is the correspondent, continues, the name Tashism is new but the form of art itself is less so, for, Kandin for Kandinsky practiced it as long ago as 1910, and there are even hints of it in Leonardo's advice to seek designs in the stones of mouldering walls, in the folded blots of cousins. From the title of the medieval devotional book, uh, The Cloud of Unknowing, uh, Sir Herbert Reed drew a parallel with the state of mind of the modern painter. For, just as the seeker of spiritual perfection and union of the soul with God must relinquish surface reasoning and deliberate thought, so must the creative artist draw his images from the deep unconscious levels of his personality. Apparently, Herbert Reed ended by saying, this is all well and good, but you need a personality to express in the first place. But I don't think there's any problem with that with Hepworth. The detail offered here ties the content of the lecture with texts wrote, Reed wrote for the journal Encounter in 1955, which is, a, which is primarily his reaction to an exhibition of painting at the Galleria Nazionale di Arte Moderna in Rome at the time of the Congress for Cultural Freedom. What he calls the various forms of the formless, he notes, can be found in all the countries exhibiting, and in most countries it's the predominant tendency which included Belgium, France, Germany, Great Britain, Holland, Italy, Switzerland, and the USA. Uh, his thoughts were they later recycled in the revised version of his book, Art Now, published in 1960, in which he adds a new chapter dedicated to the final phase of abstraction, as he calls it. But by that point, Tashism is already waning in Britain, uh, and I have to say this is in Britain only, uh, and he gives more attention to action painting and abstract expressionism. Reading these texts illuminates how Tashism brought together wide-ranging interests both he and Hepworth shared, including children's drawings, Jung, Zen Buddhism, and especially Fossillon's life of forms. At this point, the understanding of existentialism, existentialism sorry, Zen Buddhism and Jung was largely derived from secondary sources. 
invoked to add a rigor and validity for an art form that was strictly intuitive and subjective, and that otherwise would be regarded as too self-indulgent. It was too early, it seems, for self-expression to exist without intellectual justification. I am now concluding, don't worry. So, Tashism was relatively a new word, hence something of a chameleon word. Uh, initially, it was used somewhat indiscriminately in Britain, along with art informale, abstraction lyrique, art autre, action painting, and even sometimes abstract expressionism. Um, there's a wonderful exchange of ideas between uh, Paris and New York with, with Britain in the middle, uh, but eventually the Ecole de Paris loses its presidents. Um, I am going to quote something which just made me laugh. For writers such as Lawrence Alloway, Dennis Sutton, and even Reed, there pe appears to be a struggle uh, with coming to terms with its impact. For Sutton, in his catalogue preface for the Metavisual Tachiste Abstract Painting England Today exhibition at the Redfern Gallery, he says, it seems to smack of rock and roll <laughs> when one considers it in cold blood. Um, then, so, to conclude... Uh, Tashism in Britain, um, the coherence was based on the relationship of artists to their materials. That relationship was process dominant, which could have two possible meanings in this context. First, it meant the Tashit work was created spontaneously without recourse to preparatory uh, sketches or drawings. And second, it meant without exception, as far as it's possible to tell, that no attempt was made to conceal the process of fabrication by applying standards of fit finish to the end product. In reality, however, Tash's style works were simultaneously aleatory and deliberate. Hepworth's paintings, for instance, involved time-consuming preparations and processes made in advance before the, the more instantaneous, expressive curlicues and arabesques were added. Since Hepworth related making sculpture to the subconscious, this type of painting also had obvious appeal. Moreover, in the trauma left by the war, the potency of Tashism was precisely its lack of fixed meaning and thus its ability to imply a certain utopian idealism. Again, an idea that is borne out by Hepworth's expressed aims for her public sculptures such as Meridian. Thank you. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm gonna just give you a quick introduction about uh, for the work that we're doing on the catalog resume for the paintings and drawings. Um, so the, ooh, the, oh, sorry. the current catalog resume project is based on a cataloging effort that was established by Hepworth herself. And this began, first began in a systematic way in the early 1950s. Um, at that time, her then secretary, David Lewis, compiled a series of handwritten notebooks, which you see here, which catalogued her drawings chronologically, mostly but not entirely, according to exhibitions. So these volumes run from late 1927, which is the date of her first exhibition with John Skeeping at their studio in St. John's Wood, to 1953. And then in 1958, Alan Bonesse began to catalog her work in preparation for the Hodan book, which was published in 1961. And this is when the numbering system was introduced, so the very familiar BH numbers. Um, many, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. <laughs> um, Alan Bonesse encouraged Hepworth to fully catalog her work, and the manila envelope folders were begun in 1960. These folders, one for each year, were worked on and maintained by Hepworth and her assistants, as well as Alan and later Sophie. Three copies of these sets were made for the sculpture and two were made for paintings and drawings. Um, Michael showed us an image from the sculpture folders which, were, which are available on the Tate website now. Um, two sets of the drawing, the two sets of the drawings folders were left to Alan Bonas when Hepworth died, and one set was kept in the estate's office in the Palais de Danse and then gifted to the Tate Archive in 2013. The other is a working set, um, and it still belongs to Alan and Sophie and continues to be updated, so works continue to be tracked 
and cataloged as accurately as possible. So before I go into a little bit more detail about the folders and the, the way that we work from them, I thought it might be helpful to do just a quick overview of some of the significant surveys or publications that um, have focused on the paintings and drawings aspect of Hepworth's creative output. So 1952, carvings and drawings. This was an important early monograph, uh, which as you can see, included carvings together with a selection of drawings. Uh, I have another image there. Um, it also, we think, served as the catalyst for starting those early handwritten uh, volumes uh, by David Lewis. Drawings from a Sculptor's Landscape, this was 1966. It included an essay by Hepworth, as well, an as, well as an introduction by Alan Burness. And it, it included um, a selection of 76 works, ranging from 1928 to 1966. In terms of exhibitions, there have been two uh, important and relatively recent um, exhibitions that focused on her drawings. Um, 2012, drawings from the 1940s, Haslin, Hall, and Hibbert. This exhibition included a selection of abstract drawings, life studies, and hospital drawings. And as made clear in the title, uh, it focused on the 1940s, which seems to have been Hepworth's most prolific decade for drawing. Um, Oh, let's move it around a bit. Anyway, um, doesn't matter. Um, 2012, um, we have um, the Hospital Drawings Exhibition um, and the book which accompanied it by Nathaniel Hepburn. Um, this book made an important contribution towards cataloging and ordering a significant number of her works uh, from the hospital series. Um, and this, the Alan Wilkinson book, is a recent major um, survey of her drawings, I should add at this point as well, that there are um, a handful of uh, significant but not so recent exhibitions um, that focused on her paintings and drawings, namely um, 1943 retrospective at Temple Newsom in Leeds, which included 30 paintings out of a total of 61 works, and um, an exhibition of her paintings at the Lefebvre Gallery in 1948, um, in which 62 or three we think three pictures were shown. Um, and uh, 1949 exhibition at Derlicher Gallery in New York in which 39 paintings were shown. So back to the folders. Um, the folders start with the first drawings that were definitely exhibited um, alongside John Skeeping and William Morgan at the Beaux-Arts Gallery in June 1928. So earlier drawings, including Juvenilia, and um, works like the um, theater set designs and costume designs will be included um, in an appendix. We refer to these numbers as the D numbers, so it's BHD. And the D numbers run from 1 to 515. There are some, but relatively few, additions to this. It's pretty comprehensive. Um, and where additional works are introduced to the sequence, they are given appropriate numbers according to their ordering, uh, followed by suffixes A, B, C, D, as with the sculpture catalog. Um, there are a small number of D numbers which have been suppressed as well, not many, but this is usually because of a duplication. So individual entries include title, date, medium, dimensions, inscriptions, as well as a history of the work, including exhibitions, reproductions, literature, collection, provenance. But of course, the amount of information that exists for each individual work varies pretty considerably. Um, for some entries, the only information available comes from the work's inclusion in an exhibition catalog, so just like a title, um, as you can see here with D2 and 3, which I think I had. Yeah. Um, and then for others, the information is much more abundant. As you can see in the example given here, TRIO 1, which belongs to the Royal Albert Memorial Museum in Exeter. So one of the main things that we're working on at the moment, aside from systematically checking and confirming all of the information that's already in the folders, um, as well as keeping them up to date, is transferring them onto a digital platform. Um, so you can see that here is an example um, from our FileMaker Pro software, which is what we're using. Um, 
I guess it can sort of be understood as a digital set of folders that consolidates information and um, it can be easily updated and cross-referenced and of course one that will ultimately translate into a uh, beautiful publication. Um, so we're working with Modern Art Press to do this um, and just to wrap it up as my final slide I have a example from the Peter Lanyon catalog, um, an entry which they published in 2018, just to give an idea of what we're working towards for our um, individual entries. Thank you. In my 10 minutes, I just want to talk a little bit about Hepworth's library, um, which we were really lucky to have on long loan at the Hepworth Wakefield for several years. Um, and I was lucky to work on and um, curate a small display of in 2017, which some of you may have seen. Um, and I just mentioned we also had uh, a public programme alongside that, and it's lovely to have people who spoke, including Monty and Helena, um, here again today. Um, so I just thought, actually, for this 10 minutes, um, I would just really use it to introduce some of what I feel are really interesting um, volumes within, within Hepworth Library. Um, so first of all, I want to say a little bit about the significance of um, reading for Hepworth. Um, and I put up the quote from Hepworth to Ramsden. And in both her kind of correspondence and published writings, we get sort of references to reading. Um, there's one where she says, I detest a day of no work, no music, no poetry. Um, so uh, reading then is something that she speaks in connection with with carving, as in the letter to Ramsden, but also uh, um, in part, as part of other creative, day, creative daily activities, which she sees as really part, part and parcel of her whole work, um, including, including music. Um, also, reading is something that is um, undertaken both as a private activity and something in a more shared capacity. So um, what I found really um, interesting about looking at surveying the library is that it was a, a sense of what came through was not just the individual books themselves that were significant but the networks underpinning the library um, and the way in which this provided a glimpse of Hepworth's intellectual, intellectual stimulating world and one which I believe is really crucial to the development of her own work. So um, many I'm just going to go through, and here's a couple of pictures of her, um, just so we can see the library. Um, many of the books in Pepworth's personal library were gifted from friends, often sent with letters, and many contain written inscriptions um, or dedications. Um, relocating to St Ives from London on the outbreak of, of the Second World War, um, written correspondence became really vital for Hepworth to main communication and continue conversations with her previous networks. Um, and so it's interesting to think about that reading forms part of this continuing correspondence series that we get with um, a lot of previous Hampstead friends. Um, and interestingly also to think about the fact that in Hampstead, the nature of her networks was one that was um, predominantly quite interdisciplinary with figures like scientists like J.D. Burnell and Solly Zuckerman. And this kind of model of, in, of interdisciplinary friendship was something that she kind of continued throughout life. Um, later on, the importance of musicians such as Prior Rainier and Michael Tippett. Um, and these friendships in themselves um, across disciplines were also key to the development of her book collection, both through the texts gifted or recommended and the inclusion of those authored by friends. So in the library, there's a lot of books by people like Herbert Reed, there's some by J.D. Burnell, Solly Zuckerman, um, uh, Frank Halliday, the Cambridge, um, sorry, the Shakespearean, Shakespearean historian, and um, Dach Hammarskjöld, uh, the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations. Um, sorry, I just lost my bet where I got to. Um, therefore, these networks um, came to dictate, come to dictate both the library's scope and its subject matter, with disciplines ranging from literature to music, philosophy to science, politics to religion. Um, and there are moments, as I mentioned earlier, about the idea of shared reading, 
um, of reading the same text and multiple, multiple friends, often reflecting wider cultural and historical moments of particular interests in, in specific texts or authors. Um, so I just yeah, think it's key to really think about the library in terms of the relationship between both people's subjects and books. Um, so, and um, what I think the library can do is um, provide a spotlight on maybe some of the different figures in Hepworth's life um, who perhaps haven't been thought about so much. So here we've got the um, composer Priel Rainier, who became a really important friend to Hepworth um, in the 1950s. And one of the interesting things about the library is I realised that Rainier gave, Rainier gave Hepworth a lot of books that a lot of them weren't about music. Um, and it really and made me realise that actually thinking about that relationship, it wasn't just, just about music, it actually goes much further. Um, and the book uh, I have on the slide here is a copy of Rilke's Letters, um, which Rainier includes um, a piece of paper with her particular reading suggestions tucked in, in the margins. And as we know, um, Hepworth was reading Rilke, both with people like Rainier, Herbert Reed and Ramsden talking about all this in correspondence. Um, I'll, talk, I'll come back to Rilke in a little bit. Um, another figure who really emerges is um, Dag Hammarskjöld, the, the Secretary, of Gen Secretary General of the United Nations. Um, the library conta contains um, a lot of books of Hammarskjöld's writings, books about him, but also a lot of books related to the Ni United Nations news, and there are a lot of these um, United Nations news um, magazines that Hepworth seems to have, um, seems to have reg regularly got. Um, and one of the things I thought about was the fact that Hepworth famously, um, at her address for the unveiling of the UN single form, um, in New York stated that throughout my work on single form I've kept in mind Dag Hammarskjöld's idea of human aesthetic ideology and actually when you read I read a lot of the Hammarskjöld um, it really comes across the kind of points of intersection um, in their thinking um, that these are very complementary sort of similar ideas emerged with Hammarskjöld of kind of focus on integration of the ideas of cooperation that were really um, integral to Hepworth's thinking. Um, uh, back to Zen that Stephen's already touched on, and um, we've already seen this image spring. Um, but I just wanted to also actually give a page from uh, one of these Zen texts. Uh, this is the, the Alan Watts that, um, that Stephen referred to, and I really think that actually seeing them against each other, you really get a sense of the kind of calligraphy and just doing that, doing that visual juxtaposition. Um, Hepworth said that uh, there's a text, Eugene Herigel's Zen in the Art, in the Art of Archery, 1956, which she cited as one of her two favourite books, the other being Stravinsky's Poetics and Music. Um, and again, these connected with people. Um, her copy of Zen and Japanese Culture was gifted to her by Herbert Reed. Um, and obviously, we also have a lot of books in the library, and there are a lot of books in the library from Bernard Leach. And obviously, Leach was really important within the St. Ives movement um, in terms of these kind of other sort of spiritual, spirituality. Um, and we get um, also books on the Baha'i faith, which um, Bernard Leach con converted to. And um, just a quote from Herigel where he talks about closest to the feeling of Zen was a calligraphic style of painting done with black black ink on paper or silk. Um, and again, just really nice. Um, Greece. Um, so, and there are also a large number of books from the library devoted to the landscape and historic sites of Greece, um, including, and including some that also document um, Greek sculpture. And they're very, a lot of these are very photographic books. Um, some, are, some are color photography, some are black and white. Um, and the one book that's particularly interesting is this um, book called Lord Kinross's Portrait of Greece, which is basically a kind of photo book of, kind of major Greek sites. And in that, Hepworth has put page markers next to photographs of Delphi, the page on, on, shown on the screen, Vera and Patmos, all sites that would, would later become titles for her sculptures. Um, and I think it's also interesting to consider the books um, from uh, the books 
on Greece in, in um, tandem with the sketchbook that Hepworth made um, in Greece. Um, this idea that maybe that's kind of using both the sketches she'd, she'd taken alongside these books that she was either been given or 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 actively gathering herself. Um, again, some more more ju ju visual juxtapositions. Um, here on the left we have the sketchbook with drawings of Corée that she made in Greece. In the middle we have um, Christian Zervos's um, uh, Lart on Greece. Um, and on the right we have, um, which is a picture of a quarry, and on the right we have Hepler's own quarry, and I just found that really, really striking, striking par visual parallel between, between the three. Um, it's not just about what, what the nature of the subjects of Hepworth's books, but also what she, the notes that she made in them herself. I mean, on the whole, the library, um, the books aren't very highly annotated. Um, I think Hepworth was probably quite careful with her books, so they're all um, they're in pretty good condition without a lot. But there are a couple of um, really interesting examples where they do contain extensive notes. Um, what I have here is um, she has a number of dictionaries in her library which contain what seem to be ideas for, for titles. Um, as you can probably see, if, if, I'm not sure how, visu how visible this is, but um, on a number of these we, get, we can see words that become future titles, such as things like Corre, Meridian. Um, but it's also interesting to think about the kind of words that she's thinking about um, and actually that she's turning to dictionaries at all. Um, on this, this is from the Dictionary of Science, and um, we see a lot of words that um, are connected, um, sorry, uh, connected to forms, the inner and outer form. We get things like axis, um, nucleus, and things like rotating around a form. Um, we also have a number. There are surprisingly number that a large number that have that words to do with um, early English musical forms some of which did later become titles for works. Um, and another one with just these words, such as ode, partita, galliard, pavam, all written down. And that brings me, um, what I wanted to think about looking at the library is not just thinking about individual texts, but thinking about what the relationship between different texts were. Were there points of juxtaposition, of continuation between different texts? And one thing that really emerged um, is, is this interest in form and these, these books that deal with, deal with the subject of form, which obviously, as we know, is um, really, really vital for Hepworth. Um, and so, obviously, form was a topic with a historical um, significance in the interwar period. Um, modern biology began increasingly concerned to account for the production of form in nature, whilst a new psychology of form explain, aimed to explain the development of art and culture. Um, and several other, other texts um, owned by Hepworth, the product of this time, um, the Life of form, Forms by Vauquelin, which um, Stephen referred to, um, and we also have the Aspects, aspects of Form by Lancelot Law White. Um, Hepworth would famously write to Herbert Reed of her greatest pleasure in finding the phrase a life of forms in Fauquelin's text. Um, she says, quote, these four words seem pregnant to me of everything matters, the reality of sculpture. Um, on the subject of form, on the right hand side we have um, J.D. Burnell's um, The Origin of Life, um, which has this wonderful dedication um, in which he says to her, hoping to show you how forms can just arrive by themselves. Um, and on the left, we have um, a page from um, Science and Health um, by Total Blank. Um, and at the bottom, she talks about God's ideas reflecting in countless spiritual forms. And that's one of the few examples where like, the back few pages are literally all notes. Um, and I realise I, I have to come to, to an end. I was going to also... Well, actually, I will just talk briefly about this. Um, form also, single-form poem of Dag Hammarskjöld's Markings, this book which famously used single form on the front cover, and also just thinking about what the relationship between form and um, 
I mean, this text by Hamish Gold was a kind of spiritual meditation. The fact that, Hamish, that they chose to use, use that image of, of single form on the front cover, um, what kind of lines of interpretation that, that kind of offers, um, the little known fact that the single form actually in its circle had the um, dedication to the glory of God. Um, I also, just rattling through these, um, this is where Rilke comes back in, sonnets to Orpheus, the Orpheus sculptures that Hepworth is making at the time. Um, and the, I've noticed this, the formal similarity with a work um, such as Cantate Domino and these, ascend, these are physically ascending forms. We were talking about, about that yesterday. Um, and my final things I just wanted to note was also, what, interestingly, that the library also contains um, a lot of examples Hepworth seemed to get, gather any texts in which her sculpture was either written about or reproduced. And we get some, not just exhibition catalogues, but we get some quite interesting, maybe more unusual um, examples of where, where her, her, her work is shown. This is um, a projective geometry by Oliver Wisher. Um, which included a feature where, they, where he was exploring the influence of modern geome geometry on modern artists. So Hepworth reproduced in a book about geometry. And finally, um, Jellicoe's studies in landscape design, um, in which he talked about the relevance of Hepworth's drawings to the landscape architect. And I just wanted to leave that on the question of what such um, youth uses and reproduction of Hepworth's work that, oh, not just the, <laughs> sorry, um, then the wider question, um, oh, this has come out, um, of the presentation of Hepworth's work in print and the kind of interdisciplinary value it seemed to offer. Um, and that, at that point, I will, I will finish. <laughs>
seeing them and it corresponds with um, what Lindsay's been uh, noticing with the pieces. Again, four square walkthrough, uh, conserved by Pattern of Art, which brought Lindsay, Laura and Tessa together to, to work on this. And again, this was fantastic because we, we were able to use this as an opportunity for the newer members of the Conservation Tate team to work alongside the experienced practitioners. Um, so, you know, as a team, I like to, or as the team and as the manager of the team, I like to, to bring this together and so that we can collaborate and have partnerships. Um, so we can bring knowledge into the team and share knowledge out of the team, but also, most importantly, um, obtain the best treatments and care for the objects as well. And prior to the treatments, research discussions undertaken uh, and the agreed or desired outcome, and also uh, for understanding what the ongoing maintenance will be, because obviously that then has to be drawn into the, the Tate Conservation Team, and it has to be something that is manageable going forward. We also look at areas of security, uh, so we like to make sure the artworks are secure, uh, for safety, but also for the public and most importantly for the artwork. And we try and do this in the most unobtrusive manner and often using the original lugs and securing uh, bolts and plates underneath the sculptures. And this is generally done for the smaller sculptures, but recently we've had to extend that out to some of the larger sculptures simply because the garden and the sculptures are so popular with some of our um, younger groups and school groups that they are much more interactive with the sculptures than we might imagine. So uh, we have rolled out some of the securing to the, to the larger pieces as well. And touched on the string twine discussion. So uh, to try and keep the authenticity and elements of research and just practicality uh, the team, and particularly one of my technical team, have become very interested in twine making, and we have uh, purchased the equipment, and we're thinking of buying some more equipment, and they've been busy making twines um, and coming up with different thicknesses, etc. And also we're starting to look at the colouring of those, you know, could they be dyed, etc. So an area that um, is still in its early stages and obviously has great potential for any uh, collaborative um, ideas or further research in that area. And in relation to the studios, I've just started to uh, have an internal discussion with other conservation managers, in particular the paper conservation manager, about the paper ephemera from the card boxes, uh, some of which are losing their physical strength to hold their contents together, uh, to newspapers that are used as lining under the, the sculptural pieces, uh, and of course the labels. So really wanted to start to consider and bring a discussion together around how best to support this material in situ, are we looking at replication? Are we looking at replacing, documenting, and archiving? Um, and obviously, um, you know, that's, that's a much wider discussion than just the conservation team. And so, you know, a briefing note will be brought together, and then that will start to be discussed within the Hepworth uh, Tate Steering Group, and then wider as, as required. Um, and again, you know, some people occasionally certainly when we talk to the public they think oh well you know it's only a cardboard box but actually it's a it, it's a it's a part of the site and it's important to understand how we keep that there and we've also started to focus on the external marbles as over the years uh, with uh, overgrowth of shrubbery algae and the natural weather in the marbles they had become darkened so in 2017 and 2018, we set up a program of cleaning them, and we tried to do this as a gradual phase approach so it didn't seem so much of a shock to the public or anyone else coming into the garden, and also so that we could gauge opinion um, from everyone as to what level of cleaning uh, we were looking at. 
And so now the team are looking into researching um, fungicides and algicides, because of course you've got to keep on top of this maintenance now, and it'd be nice to have longevity between the physical cleaning of each of the, the marbles, so we don't want to go in every year and be, be actively cleaning. And in 2016, the summer, summer house came under the spotlight for assessment. Um, and in the in sort of since being placed in the garden, um, obviously the maintenance over the years waxed and waned, and it had got to the point where the gravel path had encroached under the summer house, so that in fact all the moisture was was simply wicking from the gravel up into the bottom of the the base of the wooden summer house. And there's some obviously some deterioration going on, and. It takes, a, again, the, the back of it takes a lot of the brunt of the weather that comes in from the, the sea. So um, I carried out an assessment and I felt that a lot of it was in good condition. Uh, got a second opinion from a specialist uh, and thankfully they were in agreement that maybe the back and some of the lower edges that had wicked the moisture up uh, were in the poorer condition but the rest was effectively sound. So after a discussion with the the steering group it was agreed that we could go ahead with a conservation restoration project of the summer house and the whole thing uh, was dismantled because it is effectively a flat pack just bolted together um, so although we had to cut through the bolts because they were seized it did still become a flat pack um, and I think you can see on the right hand side as well when we got to the point of lifting up the floor we found the original turning mechanism Unfortunately, that was completely corroded, but at least we had the, the visual of that. So the whole piece was um, stripped back. You can see the whole, we had a whole new back made, um, and you actually, the, it was difficult to get from a supplier the exact size um, tongue and groove, so that was actually cut up and sawn um, to match the original. The floor was reinforced, and we put new uh, wheels on in exactly the same position. And instead of putting a turning circle in again, we used the concrete turning circle that had remained and the new wheels simply run on the turning concrete, uh, I'm sorry, on the concrete substrate. So the, the summer house does have the ability to turn again, which in some respects is going to be helpful with maintenance going forward, because in theory we can now twist all sides round and work on it rather than actually um, go into the bushes and disappear around the back and try and work on it. Um, it does, however, mean that we've uh, created another maintenance layer of maintenance for ourselves, which is fine. So we have a regular maintenance program that goes on, and then every three to five years, uh, the whole um, summer house will be stripped and sanded back and repainted. And um, finally, uh, we've also taken this similar sympathetic restoration conservation approach um, to the gardener's cupboard in the greenhouse, which had lost all its structural strength due to a woodworm infestation that had been living there for many years. Um, and literally it got to the point where you just needed to look at it or take the formica off the top and the sides just fell away from it. So again, luckily, when we were down there looking at this, we actually had uh, Sophie down, so we were able to get an opinion straight away, look at the original structure, see how it could be remade. And again, we got a local carpenter to remake it, and because the doors on the left were a replacement sometime late 80s early 90s um, but we could see the internal structure and how the doors and cupboards would have been again we we put it back to um, its original kitchen cupboard style um, and in fact is now again used by Jody the gardener to keep all the gardening pots and his watering uh, equipment etc in there and we are now looking at the Harry Batoya diamond chairs um, to see if we can uh, fundraise to get those restored because we will have to send um, 
over to Italy to have, have those basically remade. They uh, heat form the seats and actually adhere the fabrics on them on site there. So we have sourced um, some uh, original fabrics that match the same material, um, cotton mix, uh, and we have shown those again to the steering group and to Sophie to make sure they're the right colour and shades and weave so we get a good match. So, so now all I'm just waiting, sit and waiting for my funding now. Um, but again, that just will help the public as well to, to enjoy the general social history of the site as well as the sculptures uh, and see and potentially use the chairs that Hepworth chose. Um, so as well as that, we're also looking at uh, reviewing textiles on site. So the candlewick bedspread that's on the bed in the summer house has already been conserved and currently there's a, a replica on the bed, certainly over the winter period. And we're going to be starting a discussion and looking at the net curtains in the summer house because actually they just look like standard nets, but they're really quite beautiful, with little red polka dots on them. Um, and uh, it was mentioned as well, that some of the um, fancy dress costumes, we have just had the Juno fancy dress costume, again, conserved and restored, and that has been mounted on a mannequin permanently so that it's ready to come out whenever requested or to be looked at and viewed. Um, and again, maybe because uh, it was in the, stored in the Palais, if the Palais wanted to do a fundraising drive, it's ready to go down there and be positioned and, and viewed. Um, so this is hopefully giving you a whistle-stop tour of the conservation team's um, fairly wide remit. And obviously, with everything that uh, Barbara Hepworth has and her archive, it's, it's quite a wide remit to help preserve the legacy that she's actually started and that everyone is using for, for their research. Um, so there, there you go. That's it. Thank you all for your very, very interesting uh, papers. Have we, have we got a second microphone, actually? Yeah, oh yeah, maybe if you should pass it. Um, I guess one of the things, the kind of main things that struck me, um, which I guess is probably quite obvious in some ways, but that um, we're talking about kinds of things that um, were obviously like important to Hepworth in many ways, but haven't you know, historically had the attention course so that you know you guys are all bringing attention to them now and bringing value to them now and I'm thinking of the fact of for instance that with the um, uh, the donation of the records to t the Tate Gallery archive the fact that Hepworth donated her sculpture records but didn't donate potentially the, the drawing and painting ones or you know um, and why that might be in some ways but then I'm thinking about yeah the different things and for instance the fact that at the Barbara Hepworth Museum, you show that photograph, Claire, where there was the, um, the, the books in the background, and then the decision made when the museum was set up of, you know, oh, well, potentially we can't really show those or they might go missing or that they were a bit blackened on the spine or something like that from the fire that, um, to, to remove them. And all of those things, I guess, that now were kind of bringing, you know, potentially kind of value back, you know, the other spaces like the summer house, the greenhouse, um, those other sites that maybe haven't had the attention uh, before. But I just wonder if you could maybe all say a little bit about that, about how our attention is now maybe going to other things. Like it brings value and interest and knowledge back to the sculpture, but also it shows maybe the diversity of Hepworth and you know, I was thinking today actually with, with Hep Hepworth as chemist that we had earlier and Hepworth as engineer and like all of these things that she is and she does. Um, and this, again, all of your papers, I think, showed these other parts of her, her work and her personality and her life. And yeah. Oh, you've got. Yeah. <laughs> Shall I go first? Yeah. Um, well, maybe us together, maybe. Because I think, although there are catalogues, a lot of catalogues, and the monograph is carvings and drawings, my sense is that drawing slash painting has always been a slightly secondary uh, aspect of her work. So even in the monographs, there, there are only a few pages. And likewise, she doesn't write quite as much 
uh, about drawing, the act of drawing, what drawings mean, uh, to the same degree that she does sculpture. And yet, I think they are very much a sculptor's drawings. They are, especially the, these from 57, they're incredibly physical. Um, and I would argue, potentially, that only a sculptor could have made them. Uh, in terms of their, their sort of gestural quality and the sort of dance-like uh, quality that she gets via the Zen books. Um, so I think they deserve it. And they are more diverse. And I think drawing and painting comes in fits and bursts. You know, there are periods where she concentrates on that act activity. Um, and I think it is more than just... Uh, it's more than just thinking about form or problem solving. I think it is uh, a worthy area in its own right. Um, yeah, I would agree with that. That, and it's exactly what you just said. That there's it sort of lacks the continuity that her sculptural practice would have had. I think, um, and in that, that's why we consider them as well sculptors' paintings rather than considering them how you would consider a painter's paintings. Um, it's, it's sort of a different, it's a different category. And you said, you know, that they were slightly secondary. They, they were definitely secondary to her, <laughs> tangential. But, but equally, she would, she, when she was working on them, I think she was dedicated to each individual work. It wasn't, oh, this is gonna feed into the, sculptural practice, it certainly did, but it wasn't necessarily for the sculpture. I, don't, I mean, I don't think, yeah. So. I just wonder also on that note um, about painting, um, uh, you guys will know better, but um, whether there is also that thing, um, you often get painters and you're, I'm just thinking of Picasso or Matisse, you look at their sculpture, paint over sculpture, but you don't ever seem to get it so much the other way around looking at a, sculp a sculptor's paintings in the same way. Um, I just don't know what, uh, what there is about that. <laughs> <laughs> and if I could just add, certainly when we're working in the garden and we do all of our maintenance when the public are there, that they are hugely fascinated in everything about Hepworth. So, oh, is that Hepworth's chair? What make is that? Oh, I'm, I'm going to look on eBay and see if I can find one. Oh, she's got good taste. Oh, what did she use the summer house for? What did she do in there? Did she draw in there? Did she make in there? What was that? So almost everything is just such a huge interest for everything. So the social history is, is, is hugely fascinating to the public as well as, you know, the amazing art. I think I'm just going to say that also the different ways she used the different spaces, mm -hmm. like for example the greenhouse at the top, which she said she had books, she said she hadn't got any tools in them, but she said she had books and maybe drew in them, and maybe did some writing at there, so actually kind of thinking about the actual studio itself, but actually sort of more widely how the, what those different spaces um, represent. I have a question for Stephen. Um, <laughs> in terms of the scale of the drawings, I think yeah. some are quite big and some are quite small. Okay. But, but the question is about whether it's to do, um, how much it's to do with measuring her body's limit, but also whether some of them might have been done almost, they look like somatic drawings or um, as if they were done blind, as if she, as if she closed her eyes and drew them. I, would you know much about the process? Um, I'm getting to grips with it. I would say works on paper are pretty uniform sized. From a, and the, the image of the British Council drawing, I mean, it, you, it's still got the perforations from the, from the sketchbook. Um, works on board tend to vary. Yeah. But sometimes it's the same, I mean, sometimes it's a landscape format, sometimes it's portrait. Um, my sense of the, the paintings is that it's a more complicated process. Um, I would say, you know, where she has used oil paint on board, it's a much more complicated process. And, and I think it varies. Um, where you have a big sort of splodge of ink at the start of a line, I 
I'm guessing there's quite a lot of uh, a distance between her and whatever support that they're on. Sometimes in order to have got that sort of flexibility in whatever she used, there would have been potentially that they were on the floor or at least done from a certain height. Um, and this is where the bamboo cane idea came to me with another artist um, where we were experimenting with different tools of what she might have used. Um, but also I think there's either she walked round uh, as she did it or um, that she would turn uh, the, the page or the board um, because the, the black ink where you get a splodge at the top and at the bottom, it's going over the same line because obviously if there's anything hollow, you get a big splodge at the beginning and then it runs out quite quickly. Um, and then there's another big splodge at the end. That means she's, she's redrawing. So I think there, which is why I think the whole Tashist uh, allusion is more complicated than it seems at first because they're not as spontaneous uh, as they uh, at first appear. So that's a slightly rambling uh, answer. But I guess I'm, I'm, each one is slightly different, I think, and there are ones that are more complicated than others. The drawing um, from Kettle's Yard, I think there's potentially a little bit of monoprint involved in that as well, where there's been some wax resist uh, to get a, te a sort of surface texture, but there's no wax on the paper. So I think there are degrees of uh, involvement. But Jenna will be able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Any, Any other questions? Oh, and this is obviously just my interpretation, but someone who draws, there'll be a relationship with rhythm and with sound in the drawings as well, especially in these repeated um, forms. And I would imagine as someone who draws in a similar way that she would have had her eyes closed in order to, to do that, just from my Personal experience of drawing. I'm very intrigued why there's so many of the same kind of form. Because mm. um, they, in a sense, don't vary that much. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by that. Um, but I haven't quite got to grips with the why yet. have another one which is just about um i think it's a point that you made Stephen, and then i think coming up in claire's talk which is about um like hepworth and a kind of intellectualism as well i think you kind of said oh but this kind of idea that you know you can't you can't just do something for its own sake you have to kind of connect it with uh something and then seeing how how maybe she's doing that in the in the books and i wonder whether claire maybe you might be able to say a, a little bit more, kind of speak to that point a little bit? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I think for me, what was really fascinating was sort of tracing those um, different moments um, in terms in terms of the intellectual world and where, where they were fitting in, the patterns and what was being read when, and how that re you could really see that coming through the library, um, and which the really gives the kind of argument for a lot of a lot of what they were saying, um, I think, and I, th and I think also just that what really came over from the library is just how important, how widely she was reading, and how important it was, um, and to have have books on all those different subjects. Uh, um, that this was really, you know, she was, and she was kind of finding the right people, whether that's like the scientists who know who the most expert or whether that's musicians who know about um, and re really kind of tapping into the, f the right people who would know about um, in their different in their respective areas I think. I think that your, your, your comment about how books were passed around yeah. St Ives I mean she writes to Herbert Reed about you know he'll have sent her a book yeah. and then she's looking forward to it coming back after it's sort of gone round <laughs> the, the sort of circle and uh, and then you know finally it's back and how excited she is to read it again. So. It's not really a question, because it's an unfair question, but the one thing that struck me when you were going through the books is perhaps a question of, as to how unusual such an extensive library was. The, the, re the reason why I'm interested is because the research I'm doing on Roberto Gerard, another composer, his library is exactly the same. He lived in Cambridge, he had the Burnell book, uh, his 
concept, his ideas about form and structure and rethinking what music could be in, in the 1950s and 60s is often informed by science and other arts. Very much like that. Okay. It's really, it strikes me as being very different from something like the Britain Peers Collection, which has masses of books, but it's mainly scores, poetry, philosophy, and literature. Right. There's nothing with the breadth that we find in Gerard or Hepworth's oh, library. Really, really fascinating. So although it's not a question, I would be interested in f trying to find out how unusual such a collection was and how unusual she was in being that interested and that well-read in so many yeah. diverse subjects. And I think, obviously, also kind of books of a certain time. Um, my supervisor, Alison, when she first saw the Hepworth Library, said, oh, these are all the books we had to read at art school. Um, so there was also something of it, of it, of it being of its time, and she sort of recognised recognized that. Um, but that's, that's a really, really interesting point, that similar, similar thing. Just have a, a question for Deborah, um, which is, um, I guess, if, if I don't know if this is some fair question, but whether you could speak a little bit about the restoration of the garden as well, like what's happened in kind of recent years, or if you know much about that. But I guess I'm just thinking about this idea of like the kind of holistic approach that you say to like what's going on at the Barbara Hepworth Museum now in terms of conservation and restoration, and um, whether you know or what plans there are coming up for other, other areas maybe that are going to be restored? Or I don't know if there's any, anything with that. I can't really talk about the garden because that's Jodie who does that in collaboration with the, the, the teams. But all I can say is he's done an amazing job. He really has a great eye and the planting um, is just so complementary to the sculptures now. In the summer when the colours are out, the sculptures just pop. Uh, but he is also um, empathetic towards the conservation that's required um, so that when we do have to do uh, a major intervention, uh, we just speak to him and he will lift the plants so we haven't trampled everything. Uh, he's also very good at trimming back, so, uh, so it works for the trees and the shrubs uh, and also helps prevent the debris coming onto the sculptures, so it helps with our maintenance, etc. So we've actually got a very good um, collaboration there. And I think, you know, moving forward, as I said, we want to look at some of the paper ephemera. Um, now that we've done one of the costumes, I would be interested in to see what other textiles there are, to see how we can manage those. And obviously, as Sarah said, you know, the palais, coming to the fore now, and the main area that I'm looking at is uh, making sure that the, the single form floor is managed, maintained, and kept, possibly lifted, et cetera, while um, the rest of the work may be moving forward. So there's, there's always something, because she's got <laughs> such a, a massive archive, so. Great, yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helena, for chairing so tightly, <laughs> given our time. And I just want to invite Penelope uh, to come up and give her responses to this jam-packed day. Yeah, um, this would be an, a very a challenging thing to do, but I'm, I don't know how much appetite there is now for a <laughs> response. Um, but I have read, made some notes, so I'll, I'll try and be succinct. Um, in terms of Obviously, a dominant theme is materials, which runs into surfaces, which runs into color. And I think that it came over really, for me, more clearly than ever before, um, not only how careful Hepworth was to get unusual materials um, and her level of involvement. I think we all knew that she was involved, but I think it came through very clearly how uh, uh, especially involved she was. But also, I think what came through today and yesterday, was her interest in differentiation of, of uh, or contrast. So, and you, whether she used paint or used patina to find those contrasts, I think that came through, came through really strongly for the first time, so strongly. Um, then, in terms of resources, I was thinking uh, Hepworth is so unusual in terms of the wide range of resources that we have available to us. It's not just places, all the different kinds of places that we've seen. It's also the different kinds of archives. It's the different kind of people who've been involved in studying her work. 
and you know we've heard 20 different people here in the last day and a half. It's very unusual to have an artist to have that level of um, concentration. And the records that she kept and which conservatives have kept and the tests which now can be done. So we have a, a very diverse range of material. I think it's um, quite special. And that range of voices, I think it could be heard more and used more. Someone, I forget who, talked about the undisturbed evidence uh, in the site. And I think it's maybe interesting to think about the relationship between the undisturbed evidence that we need to identify, but then thinking about the evidence that we need to disturb <laughs> um, to get more out of it. And obviously, in thinking about Hepworth in particular, but any single artist, we're always thinking about bio biography. I think when I began working on Hepworth, I felt that the, the whole concept of landscape was very old-fashioned and cliched. And I think you brought forward how it doesn't need to be seen in that way and how it can be actually quite revealing and a way to open up, thinking about the relationship between place and biography. Um, I think we always knew that Hepworth has a a great seriousness, a kind of high-mindedness, which I think was probably one of the reasons why she wasn't s so popular in her time. And maybe it still is a problem for us, how to communicate that earnestness and seriousness, which we've seen in the library. Um, you know, she, she's not a, she, didn't, she didn't want to be an easy artist, I don't think. She wanted to express difficult, complicated uh, ideas. And that, that's maybe a, a challenge for us now in terms of how to communicate the seriousness that lies behind her work. It's both, um, you know, we can think about biography in terms of the conventional approach, but also the unconventional. Maybe we can start to use landscape as a way of allowing us to think about Hepworth as a woman, even if she didn't want herself to be promoted as a woman sculptor and certainly not as a sculptress. Um, in fact, if we give ourselves a little bit more license to use some new thinking, we can understand what is unusual about her and what's, what's different. Uh, we, um, I think it was, I forget who it was, someone talked about um, the relationship between motherhood and tactility. And you know, that's, it's not talked about very much, but if we actually allowed ourselves that license to think about the relationship, we probably would go further into understanding uh, s something about why her sculpture is special and different. And I think, actually, it might be fair to say now that there are more people working on Barbara Hepworth than on Henry Moore. Um, so we're, we're always kind of a little bit embarrassed about comparing Hepworth to Moore and say Hep Moore comes in too often. But in fact, I think there's more interest now. There are more people in this room now who are doing current research on Hepworth than I think we would find on Henry Moore. So, you know, let's not be embarrassed about it. <laughs> um, let's, let's celebrate that, that diversity of approach. The upcoming projects, I thought well, people were cu curiously um, restrained in talking about their upcoming projects. Um, and I thought Natalie did a, a good job in describing the coming, upcoming project at Longside, but I think we could be more explicit about the nature of that project and what we learn from looking at sculpture by woman. Um, it doesn't just need to be a list. We need to think about what it means uh, and what it teaches us. Um, there's no, no need to hold back, I don't feel. And similarly, we, we've heard almost nothing about the Hepworth exhibition that's going to be held here next year. Um, and it would, it's a shame that we haven't had time to think about what that might be. Um, and I suppose I feel from the last day and a half we've had a, one option is to do something that is a standard survey retrospective and do it as well as you possibly could, because some people, especially younger people in this room, feel they've never seen that. Um, and other people would like to see new voices and new responses and new contexts. And I suppose the question for us really is, to what extent do we need to um, find those new contexts? Or is it that we, are we embarrassed to do a standard retrospective of Barbara Hepworth? Or is that boring to us now and do we need to open up those new contexts and think about her in a new way? I, I suppose I feel that there is a, there's something that is static and unchanging about Hepworth, which for good and for bad. And um, we do need to think about responses which are changing and allow us to think about changing ways of thinking about her. Um, I think that that's always been a dichotomy in, in Hepworth studies and um, that hasn't changed. And I think we need to try and kind of celebrate what is, you might say, 
eternal in her, in her work, but also think about new ways of interpreting her and allow some of the new ways of thinking about her to emerge and to be present. And in terms of the network, when I arrived yesterday at lunchtime, Michael said, well, why do we need a network? Everyone knows everyone already, but it's not true. I mean, uh, there's more people in this room that I don't know than I do know. Um, so in a way, it does exist, but I think it needs to be made more visible. I really do feel that the Hepworth uh, here in Wakefield could do something to show that. Um, at all these different people with different ways of thinking about Hepworth, their voices could be visible here now, not just in a closed workshop, but in the galleries, um, uh, different, you know, in, in modest ways, I think that different researchers' work could already be visible. And then, of course, we need to cultivate a wider network. Um, Simon Wallace talked about the younger generation, but there's plenty of pretty young people in this room, I feel, even if I'm one of the older ones. Um, but obviously his concern is how to make Hepworth interesting to teenagers and to young, really younger people. Um, and that's something that is going to be a challenge for you in the exhibition, and I guess it is uh, on a daily basis. I still feel um, a key lacuna in Hepworth is the international context. And we keep looking at her in relation to English, pretty much English artists and the English art scene. Um, and if there could be a chance to do a, an exhibition in which there were international counterparts at the same time, I think that would be, would be really great. And to look at her work of all periods in relation to international figures. It's more expensive, of course, to do that, but I think it would be worthwhile because I think she, she herself reveals that she's always thinking internationally, not just nationally. So, um, although we're near, near the end of our revised deadline, you've got five minutes to tell us what are the next steps for the network. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you so much, Penelope. That's a really uh, fantastic way of summing up what we might have learned from, uh, from today. Let me see if I can um, add some of, some, answer some of the things that, that you've said. And I think um, one important thing to say is that part of the idea um, and indeed the application that we've put into the HRC of the Hepworth Research Network is indeed that um, some of the research that comes out of this, the new voices, the new context, can be made present in the galleries upstairs. Not necessarily in the galleries that we were looking at today, that was supposed to be more of an exercise in kind of uh, display and what it communicates, but thinking about Gallery 3, uh, where we have a, a kind of permanent Hepworth mini-survey, but that, that survey has different focuses, and that's where, for example, Roseanne, um, who... Uh, presented her work today, that work was displayed in relationship to Hepworth last year. So this is a, a kind of a thought to continue that, to try and um, think about different ways that we can recontextualize Hepworth or rethink about Hepworth and also bring in the, the younger generation. Um, I will just talk about the network's future events very, very briefly, um, which is, and then if anyone wants to stay afterwards, I will very happily talk through the plans for the summer show next year. Um, but I know that people have trains to catch, so uh, just to keep within our revised um, deadline to say that um, this is obviously the Hepworth Research Network launch, and uh, we're very grateful to the Art Fund's curatorial networking grant scheme for um, providing us with the funds to, to bring this sort of first group of people together. We definitely intend to make the network um, bigger and to, to make it grow and to make it public in a variety of different ways, not just in the galleries here, but also thinking of an online platform where we can publish some of these short papers if people are interested. And we're sort of talking about whether that's going to be hosted with the University of York or at the Hepworth website at the moment. Uh, so I guess watch this space. We're sort of continuing to work on it and we'll be sending uh, information your way. But the idea is that there'll be two other events this year, um, hopefully one at the University of York and one at uh, the University of Huddersfield in the Barbara Hepworth building. So uh, we will um, keep you all, keep the network as a whole informed of those so that as we uh, begin to make them and hopefully next time you'll see more people here and it will keep growing and um, continuing to cultivate these sort of conversations. So that's it for today. Thank you so much. Um, oh, does anyone have any questions about any of that before we go? 
Two minutes. <laughs> no? Yes, it's been filmed, it's been recorded, and again, um, we are currently working out with our website team here how we make this sort of content available. Um, it's my hope that we basically have a HEP Research Network page, and then those of you who wish can write up your papers and that we can make those available, open access on there as well, and that as we have these events, we can continue to do this um, so that... You know, I think what's really interesting is actually, you know, Helena did a seminar, as someone mentioned, about the um, uh, Turin Studio. How many years ago now? Seven, seven years ago now? And uh, very kindly sent me the notes from that. And it was so interesting, but it's not really publicly easily found. Um, so I guess what I was hoping that partly is also that these 10-minute papers might make some of these interesting cross interdisciplinary conversations a bit more easily accessible um, for those who want to learn a bit more about Hepworth. And, um, yes. Yeah, and hopefully, you know, as I was sort of saying over tea as well, you know, I know there are other researchers in tangential fields. Uh, for example, Alice from um, Edinburgh was mentioning someone who's a mathematician who's looking into Hepworth. So I, I think it would be really interesting to expand from the material to the immaterial, as Michael said before, um, in looking at uh, people from other areas, but also um, other artists like Rosanne. I think it's a really interesting way to sort of think about some of these material choices through talking to current practicing artists as well. So. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate your generosity.